government investigate a U.S. citizen, and I was worried about the implications for the U.S. government's support of Ukraine, he said. In Iraq, mass soldiers opened fire with live ammunition early Tuesday in a crowd of anti-government protesters in the Shiite holy city of Karbala, killing 18 people and wounding more than 860. The latest assault brought the death toll of Iraqis killed since protests erupted in early October to over 220. In Baghdad, thousands defied an overnight curfew in Tahrir Square to protest government corruption and widespread unemployment. Iraqi security forces fired tear gas at students who joined the demonstrations. Today, youth are not asking for jobs or for services. The young men want a radical and real change of power. They've been ruling us for 16 years, but they have offered nothing. We are fed up with them. We'll have more on the protests sweeping Iraq later in the broadcast. In Saudi Arabia, top Trump administration officials are joining financial industry executives at a Saudi investment forum, ignoring international calls for a boycott over the kingdom's gross human rights violations, its disastrous war in Yemen, and the murder of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi by Saudi operatives one year ago. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin and President Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner are leading the U.S. delegation this week to the, quote, Future Investment Initiative. It's known as Davos in the Desert. Also attending are Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro, top hedge fund managers, and the CEOs of Citigroup, Credit Suisse, and HSBC. On Capitol Hill, Boeing CEO Dennis Muhlenberg is scheduled to appear before a pair of congressional committees for the first time since two deadly crashes of 737 MAX airliners, which killed all the 346 people on board the two planes. His testimony follows a report in the Washington Post that top Boeing executives failed to intervene <coughs> after two top pilots at the company identified problems with automated flight control software that would lead to the crashes in Indonesia and in Ethiopia. The Justice Department also conducting criminal investigation against Boeing. Democratic presidential candidate Senator Bernie Sanders has endorsed Chesa Boudin for district attorney in San Francisco. Boudin is running on a platform of ending cash bail and dismantling the war on drugs. He is the child of weather underground activist Kathy Boudin and David Gilbert, who were imprisoned when Boudin was a child. He was raised by former weather underground members Bill Ayers and Bernadine Drew. In Silicon Valley, over 250 employees of Facebook have signed a letter calling on CEO Mark Zuckerberg to reverse a policy that allows politicians to post false and misleading advertisements. The letter calls on Facebook to hold political ads to the same standard as other ads, warning Zuckerberg's policy, quote, allows politicians to weaponize our platform by targeting people who believe that content posted by political figures is trustworthy, unquote. Meanwhile, a San Francisco activist has registered as a gubernatorial candidate in California in order to run false Facebook ads of his own. Adriel Hampton registered for California's 2022 election on Monday, two days after Facebook removed this ad, which falsely claims Republican Senator Lindsey Graham supports the Green New Deal. Look at the science. Admit that climate change is real. Simply put, we believe in the Green New Deal. Included in that ad is a false Photoshop picture of Lindsey Graham arm in arm with Alexandria Casio Cortez. Although Facebook took down the video he made not as a candidate, he's hoping as a candidate they'll keep it up. In more election news, a North Carolina state court has effectively thrown out the state's congressional districts map over partisan gerrymandering to benefit the Republican Party. The three-judge panel ruled the maps drawn by Republican lawmakers in 2016 violated the North Carolina state constitution guaranteeing freedom of speech and free elections. The judges also said they were ready to postpone the primary elections if necessary in order to have the new district maps redrawn. The Trump administration's extended work permits and deportation relief for more than 200,000 Salvadorans with TPS, or Temporary Protected Status, until the beginning of 2021. The announcement came as the U.S. and Salvadoran government signed agreements to further collaborate on anti-immigration policies. The steps <coughs> include deploying U.S. Customs and Border Protection Officers to El Salvador and expanding biometric data collection. 
In Arizona, a 33-year-old Mexican woman has died while in the custody of U.S. Border Patrol. She's the second person to die in Border Patrol custody within a week in the state of Arizona. The Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner said the Mexican woman likely died from profound dehydration and kidney failure, probably as a result of an extended journey through the desert. Immigration activists have long accused Border Patrol's prevention through deterrence policy of pushing migrants further and further into the deadly Sonoran Desert, where Thousands of people have died or gone missing since the 1990s. In France, an 84-year-old man attempting to set fire to a mosque in the southern city of Bayonne opened fire on worshippers Monday, injuring two people before fleeing the scene. He was later arrested. The man, Claude Cinquet, previously ran in a local election as a candidate for the far-right national rally party of the far-right French politician Marine Le Pen. In Canada, 15 children and teenagers have sued the federal government over climate change. I'm suing the Canadian government because their inaction is costing me my health and my future. That's one of the 15 plaintiffs whose lawsuit argues the Canadian government continued to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions despite knowing for decades these emissions fuel climate change and disproportionately harm children. In Peru, a graduate student has made history by becoming the first student to write and defend a doctoral thesis in the indigenous Quechua language. Roxana Quispe Coyantes graduated from Lima San Marcos University, the oldest university in the Americas. She grew up speaking Quechua with her parents and grandparents and said the language is being resurrected in Peru. Even before our memories, since the time of our ancestors, the Quechua language was present, not only in technology, but in engineering, in cosmology. Our ancestors and our language are very rich in knowledge, in wisdom. It is being rescued and revitalized. And protesters in more than a dozen cities across the United States gathered Tuesday for a day of outrage to demand justice for black women who've been killed by police. The protests were honoring the life of 28-year-old Atatiana Jefferson, who was shot and killed inside her own home by a white police officer in Fort Worth, Texas, earlier this month. The officer shot her through her own bedroom window while responding to a non-emergency wellness check called for by a neighbor because Jefferson's front door had been left open. This is activist Tameko Mallory at the protest in New York, standing next to Atatiana's sister. They say that if we are silent, folks will believe that we are okay with the violence and oppression that is happening to our communities, and we are not okay with it. We are angry, we are frustrated, we are tired, and we are outraged. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. We begin today's show in California, where residents across the state are bracing for a day of strong winds as wildfires fueled by climate change continue to burn from Los Angeles to Northern California after a chaotic weekend of mass evacuations and blackouts that left millions in the dark. Firefighters in Sonoma, California, made headway Monday, contained 15% of the massive Kincaid fire that has burned nearly 75,000 acres in the region and destroyed at least 123 homes and structures. But as high winds pick up again today, firefighters still face an uphill battle in combating at least 10 blazes raging across the state. Public utility giant Pacific Gas and Electric will shut down the power grid for nearly 600,000 more customers in northern and central California Tuesday in anticipation of the dangerous weather. In Southern California, firefighters are combating the growing Getty Fire, which erupted in one of Los Angeles' most opulent communities on Monday, forcing thousands to evacuate and destroying eight structures. This is Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. We have fires all the time in Los Angeles, but our ability to not Boo. in the past years is much stronger uh, because we didn't have these extreme shifts of wind, we didn't have these extreme shifts of weather, we didn't have these extreme shifts of extreme weather that dumps rain, you know, as we saw in January and provides fuel now here in October. Fires in California are typical this time of year, but the length and severity of the state's fire season has grown due to climate change. Of the more than 4,000 firefighters working across the state to contain the blazes, at least 700 are California prisoners. 
While salaried firefighters earn an annual mean wage of $74,000 a year, plus benefits, prisoners earn a dollar per hour when fighting active fires. Well, for more, we're joined by two guests. In Boston, we're joined by Leah Stokes, Assistant Professor of Political Science at University of California, Santa Barbara, researcher on climate and energy politics. In San Francisco, we're joined by R.O. Kelly, the CEO of Corazon Healdsburg, a bilingual family resource center based in northern Sonoma County. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Leah Stokes, let's begin with you. You were just in Santa Barbara, and you've just written a piece, an op-ed piece, where you make the connection. The corporate media, and I'm not just talking about Fox, I'm talking about CNN and MSNBC, will bring us endless, as they should, coverage of these fires. Very critical to cover these fires. They don't make that connection as much with climate change. What is the proof? from research from scientists that climate change has dramatically worsened fires in the West. There's research that says that fires have gotten 500 percent more risky as a result of climate change and that two times more area has burned because of climate change. We know that the drought that California has recently come out of was also caused by climate change and yet some of these deeper stories about what is happening in California, what is happening across the United States with climate change are not told by the media. Instead, it's just a focus on the fire, a focus on sort of the proximate causes, and not a focus on the fact that we have already warmed the planet by one degree Celsius, and we are headed in a very dangerous direction. And Professor Stokes, what about the role of PG&E, the big uh, utility there, uh, blame for some past fires as well be, uh, for, because of malfunctions of its equipment and, and its decision to go into bankruptcy? And uh, uh, Could you talk about that, the role of the utilities? Yes, PG&E has played a really important role in the last few years of fires, and it is currently in bankruptcy in part as a result of that. It has an estimated 20 to $30 billion in liability as a result of these fires. In 2017, a number of people died in a very deadly fire in Northern California, and it got even worse last year with the Camp Fire in Paradise, California, where 85 people died. And so those liabilities are now uh, on PG&E's balance sheets, and there's a lot of people suing the company, and therefore it is in bankruptcy proceeding. It's clear that the utility has not done all that it could and should and must do to prevent these fires, but it is also facing really extreme weather that we haven't seen before. So we should definitely be holding that utility accountable while also talking about climate change and, and the fact that if one utility from just two years of fires has up to $30 billion in liability, what will that mean for our infrastructure and our organizations across the United States as climate change worsens?